This is this is the one. Hello. Hello, dog. Good. Hearing feedback. Yeah. Oh, we are ready for you, dog. Oh, okay. good. All right. Good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon. Yes. So, well, if I think some of these technology problems is why there's so many misconceptions about the vaccines, but yeah, let's, let's take it like that. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Koja Asante. I'm a director here at CDD. Let me welcome you on behalf of the board, management and staff of CDD uh, to this virtual roundtable discussion. Uh, we gathered here today to address an important subject which affects the health and well-being uh, of Ghanaians, but really by extension to all of humanity. Uh, March will be exactly a year since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. And of course, our lives have not been the same since. Uh, we have to stop the spread and save lives. And since then, scientists rallied around to develop vaccines that will stem the tide and help us return to normalcy. But ladies and gentlemen, long before the announcement of vaccines being ready for use was made, anti-vaxxers have mounted a very spirited uh, campaign against it with various theories and alternate facts. <laughs> the one that really gets me is the plan by Bill Gates through the vaccines to implant a microchip so that Microsoft can control all of humanity. 
And of course, then there is the conspiracy theory that vaccines will be used to quell Africa's population growth. Of course, I try not to be too judgmental about these things. So I will try to be a researcher and just ask the relevant questions. How true are these claims? And I believe it's one of the reasons why we are here today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it was reported yesterday that Ghana government took delivery or was expected to take delivery of doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine from the Serum Institute of India. And as we prepare for the vaccination rollout, we have to ensure that people make informed choices in this digital era of information overload and its associated misinformation and fake news. It is indeed natural for people to ask questions and to express concerns, but the source they sought to, uh, to get the answers and resolution is also very critical. This is why as a think tank committed to inclusive development, CDD Ghana is organizing this program. We want to afford the people of Ghana the opportunity to join in and get the answers they need while rectifying the fake news they might have been exposed to. Uh, certainly the medium we have chosen and the language we are using would exclude a large number of our fellow citizens from participating in this conversation. However, we hope that it will trigger more action and commitment from everyone, including the media, to share credible information on government's vaccination program. Now, CDD roundtables discussions provide an avenue and a space for well-informed reflection and conversations on various topics of, in, of national interest. And COVID-19 uh, qualifies as one. In 2019, one of our Democracy and Development Fellows in Public Health, uh, Dr. Palu, led a roundtable discussion on the role of digital and social media in improving clinical trial notions in Ghana. And today, he's joined another colleague of ours, a fellow in public health, Dr. Kwame Yesiedu, uh, to open this afternoon's discussion with a presentation on COVID-19 vaccine misconceptions and the way forward. It is our expectation this discussion will contribute to an adequately informed citizenry, increased trust and vaccine acceptance, and entreats the general public watching us on, on live on Facebook and YouTube to share their concerns and questions to enable them get the answers needed. Once again, I welcome you to today's event and wish you a fruitful discussion. I was going to do a short bio intro of uh, uh, Dr. Palu and, and uh, Dr. Siedu, uh, but I think um, uh, that you know can be shared around and you can easily find them uh, on social media. So maybe because time is fast spent, let me, uh, without much ado, uh, invite them to do their presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Kojo, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thanks for joining us. I'll be going through this presentation with um, Is it clear to everyone? Can everyone see? Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, as Kojo rightly said, um, this presentation is aimed at addressing the misconceptions and to try and lead a discussion around the way forward when it comes to um, the COVID-19 vaccination. Like I said, I work for the NHS in England, um, wearing different hats at different points, but that's another thing. Derek works for Johnson & Johnson. So how we're going to go about this presentation is I will do the general overview, and then Derek will do the specialist overview, and then at the end of this, we will take the questions and the discussions together. What we're going to be looking at is basically why vaccines and we're going to go through it based on a slide deck as presented above so we're going to look at where we've come from where we've gotten to and how we're going to exit this pandemic 
and what the role of vaccines are. So what well, the pandemic is all ongoing. Um, it's been over a year because it started in China in November, December. Some people want to argue that probably was even October, but let's, for the sake of this presentation, say November, December. But by February, March, the WHO had declared it a global pandemic. It was initially thought of as being a respiratory infection, but everyone was aware that it was going to have significant impact on everything that affected human beings, from our social world of life, our medical world of life, our economic world of life, and even tourism, and um, what do you call it, our recreational way of life. So generally, it was going to overset the apricot when it came to how we live as human beings. It went to Ghana in March of 2020. And as with every country, when it got into Ghana, everything was aimed initially at, if you could, preventing it from getting in. But the reality was once it was a global pandemic, that wasn't going to happen. So when the um, virus got in, what was used were what is termed in public health as a blunt object to slow down the virus. And I use slow down advisedly because these don't get rid of the virus or constrain it in such a way that normal life can go on. So as the numbers went down and testing, tracing and isolation started, um, there were other interventions around hand hygiene. Even there, there were issues where that there were the face mask, which is now the norm, was helpful or it wasn't helpful. It took time for a decision to be made on that. So that in itself was an advantage to the virus, so to speak, because it had an avenue that we were not aware of. But like I said, all that were being done were blunt objects. And why do I say blunt objects? They are blunt because they don't actually get rid of the virus and they give the virus a number of advantages as you can see from the slide, but I'll just speak of one or two. The first one is what we call the latent phase of the virus, which is between two and five days, which means that technically, even if you open your border and you're testing to try and isolate, someone can test negative from their destination country, get into your country and still test negative, enter your country before testing positive. If the time at which they were infected is less than two days, most likely, or between two and five days, depending on how much viral load they have. So that even now that the world is using testing at airports is one of the constraints that doesn't allow widespread opening up of countries. And so you've heard elsewhere that people say, how did like the UK strain or the South African strain or whichever strain get into another country? This could be one of the reasons. Another reason could be that the virus is mutating locally in those countries and the countries are not sequencing enough, so they don't know. So you can do as much as you want. You can say that you're going to restrict travel, you're going to close your schools, you're going to restrict behaviors like funerals, weddings, churches, and what are your goals, social activity, drinking, sports, football, and other things. But you have to know that that has a knock-on effect on society in the sense that people then start getting all these psychiatric problems, emotional problems, children's education goes back. It has an impact on your human resource recapitalization because people are retiring, people have to graduate from university. So it gets to a point where people in charge of managing the pandemic, which in most countries are governments and globally, the United Nations and the WHO go into what's called a normalcy calculation. And this calculation is based on a risk benefit analysis of not overrunning a health system, but also not allowing the country to shut so that the economy becomes totally constrained so that public goods and public services cannot be driven out to the general population. But ultimately, there is a security balance that these leaders are looking at. So you realize that if you look at Ghana, for example, now there's an uptake and there is a lot of education going around. There are compliance with the protocols. But 
The thing you have to know is that with a pandemic, at a point, even with the best will of the general population and the best will of the managers, behavioral fatigue sets in. And when behavioral fatigue sets in, especially when the viral numbers and new cases start going down, people start misbehaving. And when they start doing that, what it means is that the cases are going up and if the new variants like they are now, their mortalities also and people falling sick would increase. So knowing that this is not an option, some countries right from the start knew that the journey would lead us to vaccines because without something that would constrain the virus and prevent it from causing excessive disease and death and also prevent it from spreading, that is cutting down transmission, the global economy couldn't open up to any extent. So there was a serious drive to look for vaccines, which are technically just pharmaceutical or biological products that train the immune system to ensure that next time it comes into contact with that particular microorganism, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it identifies it and is able to overpower it. It is also known that if this overpowering occurs and the person doesn't get well, the likelihood of transmission is very low. But once you bring in the vaccine calculation, what you are looking at is to get to a point where the virus has little room to um, spread. And that brings in another factor, which is called herd immunity. This can be achieved in two ways. You can either go down the route of getting what's called the wild herd immunity, which means you expose the general public to the virus, and then once a lot of people recover, they have immunity because their immune systems know the microorganism. Unfortunately for this virus, that is a dead route because one, it will kill a lot of people. It would overrun health systems. But more importantly, the world immunity lasts between only three to eight months. The midline is about five months. Which means if you've been infected before, and it's five months down the line, you could get reinfected. And sometimes the second infection is even more violent than the first because you can get all these, what we call hypersensitivity reactions, et cetera. For this microorganism, the herd immunity threshold, which is when you think you've constrained the virus, is between 75 and 82%, depending on which sort of strain you have in your general population. That is where the tricky starts for a number of countries, especially in Africa, Ghana included. Because as Derek would show moving forward, as he's taking over from me at this point, most of the vaccines that we have are not licensed for people under the age of 60. And therefore, you need to get the population head immunity threshold from your population that is above 16 to whatever over 100 years. So if you don't have 75% or more of your population above that catchment, and you don't have enough vaccines to vaccinate at speed so that you can build ahead like countries like Israel, and now the UK, UAE, and the United States are doing, then you might have a problem moving forward. But we are here because of constraints to research and development that countries, especially in Africa, have not always clued themselves in. And as we move on to the next slide, which at this point then takes over to go through the vaccine development, and then we'd all come in at the end to do the conclusion, you would realize why at times you might think that we have shot ourselves in the foot. Thank you. Derek, could you take over please? Yes, uh, Kwame, thank you so much. Do you mind um, advancing the slides for me while I, I speak, please? No, no, that's fine. All right, thank you. So yes, um, um, the second part of the uh, uh, presentation before we, we get into the uh, uh, round, round table discussion is basically to um, help us uh, have, have a certain baseline. So understand what the uh, vaccine development uh, process looks like generally. Um, and then also look at the um, uh, currently available vaccines and what 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 uh, these vaccines do. How are they 
kind of um, developed. So this is going to be a crash course basically in um, uh, drug development. So just just bear with me, especially those who are uh, a bit more technically inclined. Um, we, we're being a bit more mindful about the general public. So a lot of this is going to be very simplistic and 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 uh, reductive in 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 a lot of technical. Uh, aspect, but it, the um, um, next step, or whether we're going to go for it or not, not. Ideally, and 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 the process is is long drawn out because it, it, it's it's an inherently experimental process. And again, I use that word um, within a certain context. And I, let me be clear: what happens in uh, vaccine slash drug development is that at the start of the process, you're trying to un understand which, which um, candidates that you have are, are going to be the most um, you, you know, effective for you. And effective here, I mean, from a safety perspective and efficacy perspective. Safety is always the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, paramount uh, yardstick in, in developing this. But then you also realize that yes, once you identify what you believe is, is going to be the right uh, candidate to go forward with, you, you, you may have some backup uh, candidates as well, and we don't want to get too technical about that. What happens then, therefore, is that you, instead of, you, you, you then end up drawing out the process just so that you give yourself ample time to validate certain necessary steps. For instance, when you're in the preclinical stage, you, 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 you're you going to check the uh, performance of the candidate on, on, on safety and then efficacy make sure that you, you, you fully understand that and then you move on to the other phases. Concurrently, as you develop, the, the, the folks in manufacturing also then have to be feeding information from the preclinical bit. So that uh, um, initial candidate also start, uh, it begins to inform what happens at the manufacturing stage. And then you go through the other processes. And as you can see in the top, on the top of, of, of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, deck, we're showing how this process draws out and typically could take, you know, a decade or so. With that first part um, where we make that go or no go decision, taking sometimes one to five years, depending on uh, what, what happens. And I know that is one of the reasons why a lot of people, you, you know, are sort of skeptical about what's happened um, with the COVID vaccine. With the question, which is a logical question, is how can you accelerate this process without cutting corners? And that's that's a valid question. So so let's let's try to understand what actually happens in a traditional non-pandemic stage, and then look at what we did or what we're doing in a pandemic stage, and then understand what what what's happened, and then we can make those uh, um, you know uh, assessments. So as I've said, the the go no go decision stage could take up to five years. But in addition to that, what, what we have to understand is that we, 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 we are in a period where there's, there's an explosion of a, a basic scientific understanding. Additionally, if you look at what's happened in, in the last uh, 10 or 12 years in particular, we've had to deal with a lot of um, epidemics. We've dealt with epidemics, um, H1N1, um, uh, influenza, we've dealt with Ebola, we've had um, 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 Zika, and now we have SARS. What happens in the scientific uh, world, drug development space, is that with each of these, we're learning, we're accruing uh, insights, so that next time round, we're, we're better prepared. We, we know which, which processes to, to trigger at which time point. Additionally, if you look at how technology, computing power have influenced every aspect of, of, of human life, you'd, you'd appreciate that, especially in the drug development and healthcare side as well, we are benefiting from these uh, uh, tools available to us. It's, it's an, an, an analogy I like to use sometimes is if you look at how um, civil engineering or um, draftsmen used to do their construction on sheets of paper, long, uh, you know, very big and, and, and manually drawn out, these days, they can do a lot of these construction work on, 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 on um, you know, um, their screens and, and, and very quickly. It's the same thing happening in the uh, drug development phase where that go or no go decision. How, first of all, how do we sequence the uh, target that we're looking at? 
Yen, if you look at what happened this year, as soon as the uh, sequence was provided, it was, it was time to go. Um, because now you know what the um, uh, uh, target looks like on, on that genomic level. You can understand what its, its proteins or, uh, um, um, uh, look like, and then design a target very quickly. And because you have computing power, instead of it taking you nine, 10 months, or maybe even a year, to develop the protein structure that you need. You can literally do this in, in, in a few days, uh, um, several days to a week, uh, to weeks. So what was happened prior to COVID is that we, we, uh, the industry was already looking for platforms that would help in addressing this need for speed in, in pandemic situations without cutting corners. So if, if you remember last year when a lot of the pharma companies were talking, everyone was saying this vaccine or the, their vaccine development was going to be done at risk. What did they mean by that? At risk he, in that instance was financial risk. So instead of doing things in series, where you, you, take, you, you, you take each, each block of the developmental phase and then do that and then you go to the next phase, we, in, instead of doing it that way, we, 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 we went for a, a path that allowed for concurrent the developmental uh, uh, activities going on. Again, you're going concurrently. It doesn't mean you're cutting corners. Your benchmarks are the same. Your, bench, your, your safety uh, 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 analysis and inquiries do not change. What changes at that point is that instead of waiting for one stage to finish before you do the next, you begin some of these steps, that uh, processes that could be independent but interrelated together. At, at a, from a financial perspective, all the finance people on the call will tell you that doesn't make sense. And that is what, from the industry perspective, we were saying is, is at risk. Because at any time point, once you're sacrificing safety. So this is what happened. Instead of a series kind of a, an approach, we went for a, a, a parallel approach using those steps that could be initiated independently without the loss of the scientific rigor and integrity of the process. Um, next slide, please. So I think I, I touched on a lot of this. So the process essentially is, is a very expensive process as a result because not all the candidates you start with are going to make it. And it's not just in the vaccine development. It's, it's a general um, a, um, a sentiment or observation that you'd see in any pharmaceutical development and, 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 and has added uh, economic uh, 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 consequences as well. And as, as, as you can see, um, attrition as a result is, 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 is definitely for very high and and all we've done in, a, in in this pandemic situation is to go from a a, a, a traditional uh, parallel situation which is more conservative from a financial risk um, management perspective to a more parallel um, a parallel approach which compresses the timeline but then puts the um, uh, de developing entity at financial risk at any time during the uh, development process and that's it. And, 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 and before this uh, uh, pandemic happened, the, the, the industry was pushing for uh, um, the development of platforms that could literally compress that go, go or no go period that I said could take anything from one to five years to a matter of weeks. Now, if you look at what happened, especially using the uh, Moderna uh, vaccine as an example, it, it literally took just about 10 weeks from when um, the sequence became announced or became public to when they were ready to get into clinic. And that is the level of efficiency and, um, that the industry is calling for. And mind you, the 16-week uh, ideal time frame in this instance, I think is almost met. If, if, you, if you consider how long it probably took um, China to sequence and, and make that um, available, then you know that the industry is meeting that benchmark that we had already set up before the uh, uh, pandemic happened. These were not things that were, were done in, 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 as, as a re reactionary thing. These were things that from an industry-wide perspective, and if you go back and look in the uh, literature and all of it, these were discussions in the public, in the public scientific domain that were being had 
half a decade, three, four years, even before um, SARS happened. And again, this was based on just following the, the uh, trend of, of what was happening in terms of the uh, epidemics we've dealt with in the last 10 to 12, 12 um, years. Next slide, please. So the next thing I want us to talk about uh, briefly at this point is basically just to have a little bit of an understanding of how these uh, COVID vaccines actually work. So to do this, I'm, I'm going to want us to just look away from the um, um, deck right now or the presentation right now, and let's do, let's try to understand from an immunology perspective what really um, happens when you know somebody gets infected by a virus or bacteria. So I'm going to do some very basic. Um, uh, immunology course here with all of us literally in 30 seconds just so we understand a few key words and then we'll come back and see how these uh, vaccines that we have uh, you know try to um, protect us based on this understanding of, of basic immunology so so everybody um, um, literally knows that we um, we have red blood cells which essentially you know transport oxygen around the body but we also have white blood cells they also have their role to play and under the, uh, uh, um, from these white blood cells, which essentially collectively are, are for defense against um, uh, external invaders, we have three main uh, types that I want us to talk about today. We have macrophages, B cells, and T cells. Now, macrophages, think of them as the um, uh, types of white blood cells that would, is, it would, would essentially be floating around um, looking for those foreign or um, invading uh, pathogens or disease-causing organism bugs, if you want to call them that, in this instance. Now, macrophages by function would essentially just um, move around, and as they find these uh, foreign a agents or, or whatever, would would en engulf them, literally swallow them up, and all of it. But there's one thing about macrophages that, from a functional perspective, is important. They they are messy eaters in the sense that as they eat, eat these foreign invaders, they leave shreds of, of, of these around. These shreds or pieces of, of the pathogens that they've eaten are what the body recognizes as foreign, antigen. So every time you hear antigen, essentially that is what you're hearing. Your body detects these antigens using B cells. So B cells produce anti antibodies that then go around after, uh, after these macrophages have left these pieces together, your antibodies go and then mop up the antigen. So when you, when you hear the, the, the uh, talk about antigen tests and all of it, that is what it is. They are tests designed to detect foreign proteins in your body or in, in the sample that is being tested. And that's, that's, that's what the antigen does. But additionally, um, uh, you, can, you can also um, imagine that once the um, um, infectious agent has gotten into your body, some of it might have already gotten into your cells. Now, the body has a natural defense system against that as well, using T cells. Now, those T cells would essentially engulf or attack those self so your own cells that have already succumbed to that um, infectious agent. So you have these infectious agents attacking those cells. So T cells will identify these ones and then automatically uh, kill them to prevent them from festering. All right. So two ma three main things. Macrophages, they float around, eat up these uh, invading uh, bugs. B cells mop up these antigens that are um, uh, the result of... Uh, what, what these macrophages have done, and then T cells essentially go around and then look for these cells and then um, that have been infected by the um, uh, foreign agent and then eat them up and then, and then kill them so they don't fester. After all of this has happened following that initial infection that you, you've gotten, your, your B cell, your, your white blood cells um, essentially do like a debrief. Okay, what happened here? What worked? What didn't work? In that process, we, 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 uh, after several days and weeks or so, you, you, you realize that your, your body is, it has learned from that. What have we, it's, it's a debrief process, right? So your immune system learns from it and says, okay, we got invaded by this, this, this invader. This is what worked from a T cell perspective, B cell perspective. And then uh, from a, a very clever nature perspective, you, you find that some of these cells, 
specialized cells that were effective become stored or some of them are saved as memory cells. Yeah, so, so, so some of these uh, T cells are saved and become memory cells so that eventually uh, in the future, if you ever get exposed to that invader again, you have T cells, B cells that were effective against the initial one that then um, are, are, are triggered to, 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 to help you uh, fight these. So that's essentially the, the, the principle behind a lot of um, pretty much the uh, vaccine candidates that we have. So let, let's switch back to, to, to the deck very quickly and, and see what's happening here. So mRNA vaccines, mRNA vaccines essentially on a very simplistic uh, basis, they, they, they basically introduce materials from your target, so in this case, the, the SARS-CoV-2, in, into your body. mRNAs are instructions for the body to build specific uh, proteins. Now, if, if you remember what, what we said earlier on, these foreign proteins or pieces of, of material are, 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 are seen as foreign, antigen. They are antigenic to your body. So by introducing um, um, uh, the instruction for your body to make something that is foreign, what you're doing then is the body produces these proteins and then your B cells um, attack them, T cells also kick in. So through that process, you've, you've given yourself the opportunity, remember what we said about forming T, um, T memory cells and, B, uh, um, and, and memory cells so that subsequently you can um, then fight the the bacterium when, 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 uh, or the infection when you see it. That's what, that's what happens here as well. So you produce it, your, your body automatically realizes that this is, this is foreign, attacks it, and then you build that long-term, uh, you build that memory. So that when you actually get the real infection of the, from the virus, your, your, your body is ready to go. And then, and then you have a viral uh, vectors, which essentially, can, can, you, can you guys hear me? Am yes, I... we can, we can okay. hear you. All right, thank you. So, 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 so the one other thing I want to quickly touch on and then I'll move on um, is, 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 is that from these viral vectors, essentially think of it as, um, in a very simplistic form, think of it as an egg that has been, um, you know, you, you, you call it out and then uh, take out the content and then replace the content with something else. The point is the shells of these vectors enable you to deliver the information that you want, which is inside the, the, the shell into, into the body. Once it gets in there, the, um, the same process again happens. Your, 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 body, your body quickly determines that these are foreign and then, and then uh, attacks them. But the point is these are not disease causing. So that's the same thing. You're literally going through that natural process of infection, but in this instance, you're using harmless um, entities that will give, give the body the same opportunity to pr provide those natural long-term benefits that you would otherwise um, um, have had had you gone through the infection normally. The, the, the advantage here, though, is that you prevent the disease-causing part of the natural infection when you go through the, the, the vaccine route. And that's, that's, that's in a very simplistic form, you know, what, what, what these uh, vaccines are, are explo uh, you know, exploiting or utilizing. And if you look, um, so the mRNA vaccine is, 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 is one of the latest uh, types that we have, very efficient, very uh, quick to produce. And, 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 and yes, it's new, but the principles underlying, underlying it are the same. Um, adenoviruses, common colds, we've used these uh, techniques in, 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 in several uh, vaccine development uh, uh, processes, uh, no problem. Inactivated uh, uh, viral uh, 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 vaccines, Every, most people on this call, especially those, those, those on the call from Ghana, most of us, if not all of us, have had those child, uh, uh, six childhood um, 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 vaccinations, immunizations. A lot of them have been uh, based on some of these um, long-standing uh, um, 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 techniques. But as, as, as time goes on, we're, we're, we're finding newer and, 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 and more efficient ways to do these quickly. 
especially in a pandemic state. And, 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 and that's, that's essentially what's there. There's nothing really from a scientific perspective that is strange, magical, mysterious, or suspicious if, 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 you, if you take a step back and look at the underlying principles and what these vaccines are actually doing. Um, next slide, please. Uh, quickly wrap up uh, the next few um, slides. So, so, so this is where we start talking about some of the misconceptions. Now that we have some of these, um, you, you know, uh, background information covered, the one one of the big things that everyone's saying, or uh, and, and 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 Kwame mentioned um, during his presentation, was was this notion that you you know some entity is trying to wipe out um, a certain population or the African population and, and whatnot. If you look at what uh, the first um, chart on the, on the left shows, you find that access to vaccine is, 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 is literally um, more prominent everywhere else but Africa. So right there, you, you, you begin to see that, that that whole notion of Africa being a target of, of all of this is not holding up. Because why, is, why are we the ones or the last to be getting the vaccine? If, 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 if they're really designed to kill or to, to wipe the African continent out, why are they not coming, prioritizing, bringing it to Africa first? But you see what's happening. People are, people are trying to literally almost monopolize access to a vaccine for their people. And that's something we're going to talk about. But, but in, in the middle chart, what I want to show is, 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 is something that you know, in, in our previous roundtable and even a publication that we put out from CDD last year, we, we, we started talking about. If you look at Israel, if you look at the United Arab Emirates, maybe the UK and all us as well, you find that some of these countries, let's use Israel as an example. Israel, Israel hasn't on its own directly um, produced uh, the vaccines by its, itself. What do I mean by that? Pfizer, Moderna, and all of these are not, are not based or are not from Israel. Israel used one of three tools that I believe are available to all of us to use. Israel, Israel went about this thing from an engagement perspective, from an, uh, um, uh, an uh, intellectual contributory uh, perspective. They participated in, in, in the design and, 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 and development at the, at the front end. What that does for you is that it gets you a seat at the table and then you can bargain. So what they did was essentially that, help with uh, some of these uh, scientific uh, developments at, the, at that uh, top end, front end, no, go, no go decision uh, uh, part. And then use that to leverage for access to the, the uh, resultant vaccines for their country. That, is, that, that, was, that was one approach they used. Now, United Arab Emirates also did a similar thing. They said, okay, fine. We, 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 we financially, maybe they didn't want to contribute or couldn't contribute uh, from the um, uh, design perspective, they didn't participate. But then there was another aspect, the execution or, uh, aspect. They chose to participate there. What do I mean by that? This is where their regulatory bodies, their governmental agencies decided, you know what? We, wanted, we want to have access to the, the vaccine early enough. We want to have a say and we want to be able to secure enough for our people. How do we do that? So they looked around and decided, okay, um, let's open up um, our population to, to participate in the testing of, 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 of these vaccines, putting in safety measures that make us as people comfortable without sacrificing the uh, scientific integrity of the overall developmental process of the vaccine, right? And then through that, again, leveraged access for their country using that. So you can participate either by, you know, funding the development process so you get early access, or you could go at it from being a part of that developmental process, either from that intellectual part or from the execution part, which is let's have some trials here and then use that option to secure um, doses for our country. You've seen South Africa also doing a similar thing uh, as well. And then, um, so, so basically that, that, that is what I want to talk about on this slide in terms of some of these strategic uh, approaches that countries are using that are not essentially you know, down to 
how much money you have or, or, or whatever. The, the drug development process allows us uh, avenues to, to engage. That's the whole point. Everybody has to engage in the process at some point to be able to then benefit. Next slide, please. And here is just general overview. And I know uh, we, we, have, we have some um, um, members on, on the panel who are um, more versed on, 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 on some of these considerations and how we're going to go about it. So I'm going to scoot really quickly through because I, I believe we'll talk about some of these during the round table as well. But one thing that I want to also highlight, and then again, just used to emphasize the point is this. So you see in the, in the, in the, in the far right corner uh, column, you, you have these uh, price points uh, for, for these vaccines. Generally, as you can see, vaccines are generally cheap, but you can even get them cheaper, again, if you, uh, if you engage. Uh, one example is that I believe in, in, in Europe right now, most of the um, uh, countries uh, are getting uh, AstraZeneca's um, vaccine, for instance, for about $2.50. Um, Brazil, in, 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 in South America, is currently um, going to be paying about a dollar and change for the same vaccine that uh, somebody in Europe is going to be paying $2.50 cost price for. Now, how did they also do that? The same thing again. They realized very early on, if we engage in the developmental process, we will then be able to secure access to some of these uh, vaccines. We will importantly be able to understand from our local uh, population perspective, how these vaccines would work in, 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 in our communities. And that is the key for me when, when we're talking about clinical research. This whole notion of, oh, I'm going to hold back, let somebody else do it, and then maybe when, when, when they're okay, I'll benefit, it doesn't translate all often because everything is about context. It's about putting things in perspective. Yes, the vaccine worked for somebody in Brazil, but you're not in Brazil. Your environmental uh, conditions are different. Your genetic composition is different. So why would you expect that the person in Brazil's result will be what you get? When you're in a different region, you, you have different comorbidities, different environmental factors, and importantly as well, different genetic uh, information. It's not a direct, directly linear or easily extrapolated uh, position. And that is why in clinical research, if you pay attention, most often when, when results are published, they have context to it. In this population go undergoing X, Y, and Z, this was the outcome. It's not, oh, this drug just works generally and that's it. No, you always have to have your context to it. And that for me is, if anything at all, is the message I want to, I want to put out to people. What works in one region would not always work for you. You have to be involved in the, in the, in the process to then un and make informed decisions for your people, for your country. It, it may work, it may not work, but you do not know that until you engage. Next slide, please. So I think, well, okay, so um, I, I have touched on a little bit of this, but essentially the one uh, other topic that we wanted to talk about was uh, vaccine nationalism, where you have, it's essentially this practice where you, you have people, uh, uh, countries trying to secure as much um, uh, of, of the vaccine earlier on for, 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 for their population, where people have been more nationalistic in their thinking than global in their thinking. And, uh, you, you know, it's one of those where you're asking the question, you know, are we saving, uh, should we be focused on us or should we be focused on, on the whole world? Now, in, 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 in the pandemic situation, it's easy for everyone to want to be nationalistic, you know, insular in their thinking, but that only helps the virus because you could do whatever you want in your country, bring it down to zero, but what, what's happening in the next neighborhood or the uh, next, uh, your neighboring uh, country or even far away um, destination impacts you. Because so long as the vi virus is not controlled globally to a level where it doesn't have enough hosts, the virus is constantly replicating, going through its uh, um, 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 div uh, division processes and picking up those mutations. 
those mutations are what eventually would help it subvert whatever practice, uh, protections we have. And that is why what is important in this COVID situation is a concerted global effort, not individualistic, um, um, singular kind of um, thinking. We all have to engage and play our part. This is the quest, this is what our current generation is facing, and we cannot stand on the sidelines and do this. In the same way, it's not right for any one country to, to monopolize all of it. Yes, there, there are financial reasons there that, that for people to justify that. If I have paid for it, I have put in everything for the development, then I should have first dip. Well, yes and no. You, you can do it that way, but again, the rest of the world will have these viruses festering and, 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 and poses a, a threat to all of us. So, so that's, that's, I think, all I wanted to say on this point. The vaccine nationalism doesn't help any one country or population. Again, um, so, before, so going into this whole vaccine hesitancy issue, where uh, just, just to level set, vaccine hesitancy is essentially a delay in acceptance or refusal or, 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 of, of, of vaccination. So if we use that very simple um, um, definition where we're saying hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy is okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wait, let's see, you know, maybe a thousand more people in Ghana or 2000 people uh, get vaccinated, I'll wait two months and see what happens and then maybe I'll make a decision. Or outright, I don't want to participate in that. That's, that's essentially what vaccine hesitancy is. And, when, and we did a, a straw poll, CDD did a straw poll to try to understand how people feel. Again, you know, uh, skew sample size and, and convenience sampling, all of that. I, I get it, so the stats guys, please bear with us right now. Um, just trying to get an insight of, of, of how people feel. And in the top left corner of, of, of the, the uh, um, deck, you, you could see that we, we're, we're falling very short of the, the, the numbers that we need to even get us close to her, um, you know, that community or herd immunity that uh, uh, Kwame uh, briefly mentioned. If you look, only 41, call it almost 42% of responders said they'll, they'll, they'll take the vaccine outright. You, you have the remaining uh, 52%, um, uh, you know, at, at, at essentially saying no um, at this point. That is telling. But then the same group of, 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 of responders were asked the question again, what is it that would inform your decision to get vaccinated? Um, that's the one in, in, in the bottom um, uh, left of the, of, the, of the deck. And all of them, I mean, pretty much the overwhelming majority, 93% nearly, um, said science and evidence. Now, if we look at what we've discussed and looked at, especially in my first two presentation slides, you realize that if really it is about science and the evidence, then we, we, we would expect that more than 41% of, of respondents will you know, uh, be, be more open to, 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 to get, getting uh, vaccinated once their vaccine becomes available to them. So then that, 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 that made us ask a question, what is the problem then? And, and just as um, Dr. Santi mentioned at the beginning, in 2000 and, uh, 2019, we had a roundtable discussion where we talked about the role of social and digital media in debunking some of these uh, um, clinical trial uh, misconceptions or hesitations that we had. And I made, I made an assertion back then, which I, I believe plays into this, that we have a knowledge gap. And when I said it, I think, um, it, it was probably not, you know, uh, it was probably misconstrued. What, what I meant and what I still, I, I still uh, believe is going on right now is this. From the technical perspective, those of us in drug development, we have access to the information. We know what's happening. We're comfortable with what we're doing in, uh, from a safety, ethical, moral, any, 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 any yardstick you want to look at it. But that information, that sentiment is not being transferred to the non-technical or the lay person. And it's a communication thing, right? So if we can find ways where uh, we communicate better some of these findings, like I said, you know, even before COVID, four or five years before COVID, we're already talking about how to accelerate some of these uh, uh, processes safely. 
this was out in the in the uh, public domain for the industry, not for the lay person. So those of us in the industry were looking forward to it. We knew what was going on, what we were doing in terms of trying to get this done and done properly and safely and in a quick way, so that nobody, you know, we don't lose needless lives to to this uh, these kinds of pandemics. But that, those kinds of details haven't been put out. And then all of a sudden, we're here and we're saying, oh, guess what? Something that usually takes a couple of years, we've been able to do it in a few months. Naturally, people are going to question that, that, the, that, 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 and that's where we are right now. And then the final um, um, image there to the top right was is, is a question that we asked saying, where do you normally get information? And, and, and again, this leads to that roundtable discussion we said. It's all about social media right now. And unfortunately, a lot of that information is not vetted. It's not validated. It's by, you, 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 you know, can be from anyone and anywhere. And because phones are so ubiquitous right now and everyone has information, it's so easy to, to, to have this information passed on. Somebody sends it to the next person, you're laughing about it, somebody is outraged or whatever. The point is these, these, these um, media, uh, and as much as could, can be very beneficial, can also be um, detrimental if, if we're not proactive in, 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 in some of these. And if you look at it, pretty much no one's looking at peer groups. No one's using uh, viral videos. It's all about the internet. And again, it's all about your source and your context. So for me, wrapping up before we go into the round table discussion, I think the main things that we need to focus on is how do we get this information off the shelves, off, 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 off the labs, into the public domain, and engage in this kind of a dialogue where those involved can try to you know, break things down in ways that we can all relate to and ask those questions that would help us from a national perspective say, okay, if we're gonna engage in this kind of an enterprise, a uh, biomedical enterprise, how do we do it as a nation in, in, in a way that makes us comfortable, but then helps us not lag behind in terms of access to um, the benefits of some of these uh, um, 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 developments. So next slide, please. So I think a key message is, um, well, uh, a key message at this point before we, we have this uh, discussion is that generally, yes, vaccines have been with, with us for, for, for many, many years. Um, pretty much most of us on the call have had, uh, you know, a, a handful of uh, vaccines already, and they're safe um, and if, if, if efficacious. New, uh, as we deal with new ones, we obviously have to apply um, a certain level of transparency, communication, to be able to understand how these work within our context and, 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 and then move forward. Next slide, please. The, the other thing as well is we need to urgently address this knowledge gap, this uh, communication gap between what's happening in the industry, what's happening um, in, the, in the medical field, what's happening or what information is getting to the lay person or getting around to, 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 to the non-technical uh, people as well. Because it is important. Because if we don't do that proactively, then you, you create avenues for you, you know, inaccuracies, sensational um, you know, uh, reporting, or, 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 or the like. We also have to find a way to um, uh, uh, contribute. We also have to find a way to address these vaccine hesitancy and, and nationalism in the context of our own national, but then also with the view of the, of the, of the global public health um, um, and security as well. How do we as a country um, engage and make sure that we get access to the, uh, you, you know, the best uh, me medicines, the best, best vaccines without you, you, you know, putting an undue pressure or strain on, on, on our populace, but then also not being overly cautious that we, we, we then end up missing out on, 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 on the timing because with, with, with most of these things, it's, it's the timing that is key um, um, to, to, to these and as much as the safety and efficacy are, uh, of, of, of the uh, 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 treatments that we're looking at or the vaccines we're looking at uh, is also important. Um, I think 
that's about it. Um, if if I'm if I'm I'm, I'm correct. Um, and then next thing we're going to talk about, as you can see, is is the uh, objectives for this. So we literally at this point just want to talk about how do we address this uh, um, burning issue of misconception as far as the vaccines go. This is where um, I'm going to be joined by the the remaining panelists to actually answer specific questions now that we sort of have a background to, to this whole discussion. So I'll pause there, uh, Mami. Um, I think um, you, you take over now, I guess. Thank you very much, Dr. Akpalu and Dr. Kwame Sapunisidu for that insightful presentation. We'll move straight into the discussion and our moderator will be Mabel Aku Banase, who is the Managing Director for Credit Comps Limited, which is a full service corporate communication, branding, and media consultancy firm. Until 2019, she worked with the Graphic Communication Group Limited as a journalist for 18 years. She's also a human rights advocate and a philanthropist who uses her social media pages to help the disadvantaged in society. So Ms. Banase, I hand over to you to continue with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be part of this discussion. Um, we are moving to the discussion stage. We are honored to have in our midst Dr. Anthony Isia Asari, Presidential Advisor on Health. We have also here Dr. Kwame Amponsa Achiano, Manager, Extended Program on Immunization, Ghana Health Service. Dr. Vera Dan Dansa Asante, Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana. And then we have uh, Ms. Caitlin Adi, Deputy Chairperson, National Commission for Civic Education. We also have in our midst um, our previous presenter, uh, presenters, Dr. Kwame Sapona Siedu, and then Dr. Edem Akafi. We would move straight into the discussions. Um, COVID has, has caused a lot of havoc around the world and is still doing it. The last time, the last time I checked, um, about 112 million people have been infected and 2.4 of 2.4 million have died. US alone um, has like has recorded 500,000 deaths. And in Ghana, Ghana has not been spared. 500 people and more have gone. And we all know what COVID has done to the economies around the world. Businesses have been affected, jobs have been lost and all that. And we are all, we are all looking forward to getting back to normal, like get, looking forward to a normal life like we used to live before COVID came, COVID um, red is ugly head. So I'll move straight to the point. Um, we have quite a number of questions before us and Miss Caitlin Adi, hello. Hello, Miss Adi. Here, here. Hi. Okay, yes, Miss Adi, thank you for coming. Hello, oh, Miss Adi. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, I'm stopping. Okay. Okay. So, Dr. Dr. Akaku made um, read a few um, pointers from us. Like there was a short survey conducted by the CDB, and it came out that quite a number of people are hesitant to take the vaccine. And it all boils down to education. And that's why I'm taking you on first. I'm mentioning you first. And um, what what has the NCC done so far? How how far have you gone with the um, educating the public to accept the vaccines? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, so for now, we, we thankfully this time around we were we have been part of planning and um, for the COVID response, the national plan for the COVID response. Thankfully, this time around we have been part of that process from the beginning, and we have been um, working closely with the Ghana Health Service. You see, we're also working closely with, um, uh, how do you call them, the Ghana Medical Association and all of those people. Because the important thing for us is that even before our staff go out there, we need to make sure that they are properly trained and well informed so that they don't go and add to the misinformation. So as we speak, our staff, directors and staff of the commission are currently undergoing 
series of training, um, we've had one with GMA, we have a, a couple more with the Ghana Health Service. And the idea is that we want to equip them with um, the necessary information needed before they go out there. We have um, offices in every district, as you know, and we have staff there who undertake public education for their district. So once the directors get informed, we come together and, and, and produce information packs and produce education material and all of that. And then we have a program guide that goes out to the, the district so that the, the district director and his staff within the district will organize the campaign um, sometimes in ways that differ slightly from district to district, depending on um, local, local conditions. So we haven't gone out yet, except for um, doing key interviews and like, at, this, at this stage, um, going on radio shows, particularly here in Accra and other major cities. We, we have not um, deployed our district education campaign fully just yet, particularly on vaccine. As you know, we're already out there um, doing the education on the COVID protocols. That is still ongoing, even though at a more re at a reduced level. But we have not commenced the vaccine campaign. I have to admit, except for working at a high level, at, at, at a high level, and you know, and taking advantage of opportunities like you're offering me on this platform, for which I am most grateful. So that is it for now. But we are working really hard towards that. I mean. Campaign should launch in the coming days. And once it's out there, we want to make sure that the information we have to counter the fake news and uh, misinformation out there is actually correct. And it doesn't confuse people more. The thing about NCT is <laughs> our, our big strength is in breaking down all, in, in, any kind of information, technical um, or otherwise, into basic bits of uh, uh, information, breaking down complex into information into basic information that everybody can understand. Uh, How's the feedback so far? Uh, our staff work in the local languages within every every um, area. We we have people who speak the language of the area, and they do most of the work in the language of the area. So um, okay. that that will start very soon. Okay, Miss Adi. Um, thank you, thank you, Doctor Ansia Sari. Hello, Dr. Asari. Dr. Asari. Yes, madam. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, Sir, so, there's this question that keeps going around. Um, people are saying that uh, they are tracking devices in the, in the vaccines and that the, the period for testing was too short and that it's not so safe. So they wouldn't take it. And uh, there's another issue that has also come up. Why, why is Ghana rolling out two vaccines? AstraZeneca and then the one from Russia. So these are some of the issues that keep coming up. So um, please, what are your reaction? Yeah, thank you very much. I think this, I, I want to also say a big thank you and uh, ex for the excellent presentation from the two presenters, Kwame and Dr. Isaac Yes. Uh, yeah, they, I think they've explained everything to us today. The reason being the anti vaxxers have been going around saying yeah. that we're missing, uh, the DNA, we are changing people's DNA. Uh, also, the vaccines were developed so quickly. But I'm sure today everybody listening to us has had the benefit of the doubt. And we have all been schooled. Everybody has gotten to know that. We are not using the same old methods that we used to use for development of vaccines. And as uh, Dr. Malu said, uh, in the olden days, we all know that all, we all went through the normal childhood vaccination. And most of the vaccines that we, we went through we used were vaccines which were developed and they were all uh, inactivated live viruses which they injected to us. But people are not used to the new type of technology which is being used using the messenger RNA to stimulate antibody formation in our bodies. So it's something that has been done. And what I even learned today is that this is a risk. This, this was an economic risk that they took because you are not even too sure. You are, are fast-tracking the, uh, the 
fraction of the vaccine, we don't even know if it's going to work in the first, second, and the third clinical trials. If it doesn't work, it means you failed. But here that you have to go through a system and then to go or not to go. So that's one good lesson I've learned. The second point was that uh, people also were using that we are going to wipe off the population. And I think uh, Dr. Palu also explained that one very well. How come that people want to wipe out of our population, most of the vaccinations that they are doing now are in those countries. They are not in Africa. Africans are yet to start. I think one or only about two or three African countries have started. So that also answers that question. And I think that these are some of the things that we have to use to counteract whatever the misconceptions are all about. Today, I'm well schooled, and I'm sure everybody here who is going to take part in the risk communication is also school. The next question is that how come only two vaccines have emergency use authorization? I, you know, if you look at it, most of these vaccines, the countries are giving it emergency use authorization. Ghana has asked for the dossier from all the manufacturers. We are not going to use only one. Anywhere we will get vaccines to buy, we we'll buy because if our target is to vaccinate over 20 million population. As the president said, president vision is to give vaccine, vaccination to almost every Ghanaian who needs it. So we need to buy at least, if you are going to give the two doses, which you have to give, at least 40 million for the population, and then plus or minus, maybe you have to add about 5% uh, wasted to it. So we need over 42 million uh, doses of vaccines. We cannot get it from only one source. So we are ready, any vaccine which is efficacious, which is safe, that's the most important thing, and also deplorable use. But as at today, I think we have received a third dossier for other Sinovac or Sinopharm. And we, we are also going to actively ask for all the other manufacturers to send their dossier to Food and Drugs Authority to give it emergency use authorization. So it's a, we are in the process, and it's a, something which is going on. But we have AstraZeneca, and at the moment also we also have the uh, Sputnik. But I'm sure okay. before the end of the week, we will get it from the other sources, especially. We know that we are also on COVAS, and I know that uh, COVAS has, got, uh, has given authorizations or the approval to uh, Pfizer, Modena, John, I think Johnson and Johnson and other vaccines. So we are going to ask for the union, and they all will be, they will all have their emergency use authorization. We take more okay. than week or two to go. So it's something it's, there's a process in progress, and as and when we give any organizing a company the emergency use authorization, we let clients know about it. Thank you. Okay, okay, Doc, I'm I'm back to you again. Hello, Doc. When yeah, are we, have we taken custody? Have we received our vaccines? The first batch, are they in? The first batch, I would say, will be in this week. So anytime, How many are we expecting? Um, we are expecting about 600,000 doses of uh, AstraZeneca vaccines. And any time before okay. the end of the year. And so what um, is your target audience? Our target audience, if we are going to at least about 590 something. We are giving 5% 5, 5 wastage. And um, we have segmented the, the population. We have also segmented the dance geographical segmentation using our own uh, data. Because in our data, you already see that uh, we have hotspots in the greater Accra metropolis to the surrounding districts and also Kumasi, greater Kumasi metropolis. Uh, okay, so for, when um, the public also wants to know when, what's the Ghana's plan, uh, vaccination plan, the whole, the total rollout, when will it begin and when will it end, and what percentage are you looking at, like population, to yeah, achieve target, the head immunity? I'm targeting the population of about 60% plus. I think Dr. Achiano is online, and Dr. Achiano will give you the total deployment plan because he is there. They are the people who are going to do the deployment. But what I'll tell okay. you is that we want to at least vaccinate 20%, uh, 60% of the population. Within which period? Dr. Chiano? 
Thank you, Doc. Dr. Achiano. Hello. Doc, please, are you online? Yes, I am. Can you okay, hear me? Thank you. Yes. We want to know um, with the period, with the rollout plan. I mean, we want to know with definite, give us definite timelines. We need definite timelines okay. for the immunization program. All right. So, at the advisor to the president on health, or advisor on health to the president rightly said, we are expecting vaccines, first batch of vaccines by the close of the week. And so if you ask me for definite timelines, it will depend on the day that the vaccines arrive. But because we know it is arriving or they are arriving by the close of the week, come next week, we will start. That is the first week in March. We will start the rollout. Hello. The hell you need to that. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I Dr. think Tiano? along the line my my, my internet dropped. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um I was asking Yes, I was that saying that at least we know about Yes, you were asking oh. Yes, so immediately after we receive the vaccines, we'll go into action. So we are feverishly preparing for that. Okay. Day and night we are yes. we are here and trying to put, uh, finalize our uh, micro plans. So and I, I was asking, at, within next, which period do you want to achieve the... And I was asking, first within which period... Mm -hmm. No, 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 not the start date. I, I, you've, we've cleared that one. I was asking, within which period do you want to, um, like, are you looking at immunizing the entire population, at least a certain percentage, that's 60, 70%. Okay. Yeah, so uh, with the initial target of 20 million, we are hoping that by October, we should be October done. what? But of course, it was October, October by year? October, it will be done. This year, 2021. Oh, we are in 2021. Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Santi has dropped in a question. He's asking that uh, it looks like we'll, get, we'll be getting vaccines from different places. We don't all have the same efficacy. If not, how do we communicate to the public in ways that do not undermine confidence in one vaccine compared to the other? So he is asking okay. about the efficacy. Think, you know, Doc, you come in. Yes, you I pick think, that one. Uh, the efficacy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You see, this whole issue about efficacy, and this time I'm wearing my hat as a drug analyst and a quality control person. So I would, and then I would shift into biomedical science a bit. This whole thing about efficacy has been overplayed. That was why when I started presenting, I talked about the herd immunity threshold. In actual fact, you are better off having over the herd immunity threshold of your population immunized with a vaccine that has a, an efficacy of 50% than immunizing less than the herd immunity with a vaccine that has an efficacy of 90% because the larger your susceptible population in which the virus is replicating and mutating, the chances are that that 90% vaccine would soon become inefficient. And it happens on a yearly basis with the flu vaccine. That's why every year the flu vaccine is changed. So the conversation we should be having, and that's why I'm happy with what Dr. Chiano and Dr. Siasa have said, is how quickly can we get to herd immunity? How quickly can we get streams of vaccines in? And the answer to that question is we cannot get it from just one stream. The efficacy shouldn't be the problem. As long as the drug has uh, emergency use authorization and has been shown to elicit immunogenicity, we should go for it. If we hit the head immunity threshold, we are safe. That, that should be the game plan. It's like a 100 meter dash. Yeah. And that's what the Israelis have done. The Israelis have run to the finish line, and now they are finding out that actually, in the clinical trials, the efficacy that was even being reported is much lower than what's happening in the general population because the more people are being vaccinated and the more the virus is being constrained, the less the likelihood of hospitalization. And so, okay. every time I hear this efficacy, efficacy, and obsession with efficacy, I just find it so, so strange. I'm like, we are missing the boat here. 
This is not okay. paracetamol or codeine, where you're okay. saying that the drug should be 100% pure. I'm really sorry, Doc, but I needed to go in on this. Doc, sorry, I need to cut in again. Um, there's a question from Sena Afali. She said, I learned the vaccine is in two doses. I want to know if changing the brands for the first and second dose give any problem. The, the, two brands. Um, so, how is um, it again, if, yeah, if I have to come in there, there are clinical trials going on on vaccine swaps. The interesting thing is, if you look at the Sputnik vaccine, actually, it contains two different forms of um, viral vectors. So technically, that one is what I call a tunnel. In fact, what the Russians did on any, any given day, I would even not think many biomedical scientists would dream of doing it. But they've done it and it's proving to be very efficient. And so now people are thinking of clinical trials to see if, for example, you can do an mRNA va um, vaccine and a vector vaccine or um, any of the other combinations. The reason being that is it possible that, that hitting the immune system from two points would give a better immune response than just hitting it from one point with two booster doses? So the answer is for now, no. But it's been actively looked at to ensure that in the future, yes, that can be done. Okay. Um, there's another question here. Someone, Emmanuel Inkum, wants to know, he's asking if, um, can a person living with hepatitis B be vaccinated? And let me just take the questions and then you put them. Can anyone volunteer to take the vaccine even if the person is not considered among the frontline and critical group? And then can a person planning for conception be vaccinated? So let, let's take the hepatitis B first. And and Dr. Chalou will be the best person. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Chalou? Yes, I along the line, I, 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 uh, my internet uh, faded okay, away. Okay, Dr. Chanu, so okay. So if you could There's a question from Emmanuel. If you could okay. re the question. Okay, there are three. I, we don't have enough time, so I just want to put them together. Um, one, Emmanuel Inkum is asking if someone with a hepatitis B can be vaccinated. Then the second question is, can anyone volunteer to take the vaccine? even if the person is not considered among the frontline and critical staff, critical group. And then the third one, can a person planning for conception be vaccinated? Yeah, maybe so, let, me uh, take, let me take the second one. Can anybody okay. be vaccinated? Volunteer. <laughs> volunteer if it is not in the, what have, have, uh, have what they Yes, do. yes. I'm sure the person they understand us very well. We've segmented the population. We want everybody in Ghana who, who is supposed to be vaccinated to go and vaccinate. I call it voluntary compulsory. We are vaccinating not for only yourself. We are vaccinating for your neighbor. We are vaccinating for your mother, for your old grandfather and your children and your great uh, what, your grandchildren. We are vaccinating for the population. So when it comes the time that your time has come, please, when you see the advert or we, you see a prompt of SMS message or announcement, go to where you are supposed to go to and go and vaccinate. It is not that people are volunteering to go and vaccinate. It is people are going to vaccinate for their own good. Your health is your responsibility as well as the government's responsibility. So we are all going to vote, how, uh, sorry, to, to vaccinate. I would say that this is a, a voluntary compulsory or volu compound. Everyone okay. goes to get them. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so let, let me add a bit to what um, uh -huh. my, my okay. former DG said. Yeah, I think the question was whether you can volunteer yourself for these particular 600,000 doses. For that, no. But what my, my former DG was saying is that eventually everybody will get vaccinated. And so when it is your turn, you have to go. And that's what he's uh, calling voluntary compulsory. But it's actually for the 600,000 doses, it's, it's because of the, the paucity or the fact that we don't have many doses. We have segmented the population. So it is not as if you can volunteer and go and pick it. No, they are meant for those segmented populations. So just a bit to add to what he said. 
Now back to the question of if you have hepatitis B. Yes, um, hepatitis B is even considered as one of the one of the conditions that we will call people with underlying conditions or one of, one of the diseases that will qualify as people with underlying conditions. So they are actually one of the, the, the major targets for, for, for this Dr. Uh, phase of the, of the campaign. Yes. Doctor. Can you hear can me, you please? please? Yes, okay. Um, thank you for telling us about the hepatitis B group. Can you give us a list of other people who fall under the underlying health conditions that will be clearing their minds? as to who falls within and who they does are, not? Yes, they are, they are a gamut of them. So I'll mention the common ones. There's a few, the key so ones. So we have okay. hypertension, hypertension, diabetes, the cancers, and those with um, uh, cardio, other cardiovascular diseases apart from hypertension. And then um, people um, Long disease. with immune deficiency, uh, obesity, and then asthma or other chronic respiratory, the chronic respiratory diseases. So these are about a few of them. Thank you very much. Dr. Avera Asante. Doc. Hello, Doc. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Okay, hello. Thank you for coming. Um, the Pharmaceutical Society is, is, I mean, one big, um, player in this whole COVID what, um, like what is happening around the world. And we want to know, what the pharmaceutical society, what are your plans for this vaccination? And then there were, there were, some people were asking this thing about storage, storage, storage for the vaccines. How can we depend on you? What plans do you have for storage facilities and other issues? <laughs> Okay. The, the last question is, it's not for the pharmaceutical society. It is for the It's program. for you. Okay. Yeah. So, I'll ask yeah. okay, so Dr. Chiana, I'll come back to you. As but I want to know what the pharmaceutical society has in store for us. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mabel, for having me. And thank you, TDD, for this opportunity. Um, as far as pharmacy, a uh, pharmacist is concerned, I think we, uh, a critical, we play a critical role as far as um, the rollout of this COVID-19 vaccine. Um, number one, we, we are in the first line of contact for many of our um, citizens. And so it becomes, we, uh, Dr. Apau talked about the knowledge gap that you know we are having issues with the hesitancy about the vaccine. And I think when it comes to um, what pharmacy or pharmacists can do, um, as people come to even just purchase their medication, we can take that opportunity to educate them on the vaccine. And so that's one thing that the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana is doing. We are also um, advocating for pharmacists um, to be trained to vaccinate as well. And we are working on that. We have a webinar coming up and uh, we, we are working with the different stakeholders um, into getting this done. So um, there is a lot of plans in place and in getting involved. And we know that pharmacists are very critical in um, rolling out this vaccine, um, COVID-19 vaccines and making sure that we get um, our citizens vaccinated and um, also educate the general population about vaccinations. Okay. Dr. Achianu, Dr. Asante, thank you very much. Dr. Achianu? Dr. Achianu? Yes. Um, please, yes, the yes. question on whether a pregnant woman can, someone who is pregnant, and then the storage facilities. Yes. Okay, so there are clear guidelines for on pregnancy. Okay. Um, so... WHO, the strategic advisory group of experts, which advises the world on immunization. In fact, they are experts in immunization and related technologies. They advise that you do not need to postpone pregnancy because of vaccination. So I think that answers the question. The other thing is about storage. Yes, um, if we were getting vaccines, in fact, there, there are disadvantages and advantages in get, not getting the vaccines and block. We would have loved to get all 42 million at the same time. That would have posed a lot of coaching uh, challenges for us, but we would have okay. resolved it anyway. So 
the way the vaccines are going to come, they come in uh, a few millions. We have the capacity to store them, particularly for those that fit our system of plus two to plus eight degrees centigrade. We have yeah. all our vaccines, are ex except one or two, are kept at plus two to plus eight. We have coaching equipment at the national level. We have a national code room. For the 10 old regions, we have regional code rooms. We only have deficits at the, in the new regions. But of course, these regions cut, cut vaccines from their parent regions. So for example, Western North cuts vaccines from the original Western region. We have excess capacity at the regional level. We did a gap analysis at the district level, and only 15 districts will need beef up of the coaching equipment, especially for the plus two to plus eight. For now, that is not a challenge because for a few millions of doses, we get it at the national level, then we quickly cut them or push them to the regional level for storage. Even where the national level storage is overstretched, we have the Greater Accra Regional uh, code facility, which is underutilized. We have an excess of over 50%. So for coaching, we don't have a problem for now for the plus two to plus eight. Okay. But for those Dr. vaccines Keanu. that require, can I please land? Okay. For okay. those vaccines okay. that require negative or ultra negative, the plans are that we are revamping the coaching structure, especially looking at strategic areas like the big hospitals in the regions, the regional hospitals, the teaching hospitals, and a few of the big district hospitals so that we can stop there with these um, uh, negative or negative coaching equipment. So, okay, so uh, that is where we are now. That is for story. It, 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 it's, it's, it's clear Ghana is well prepared to take stock of the vaccines. Thank you. And then there's a question for you again. Practically, how would I know? Um, Charles Bache wants to know. He's asking, how would he know if it's time to get vaccinated? And then how would his mother in the village who has asthma get notification that it's time to get vaccinated? So Hello. the unit of operation... Mm -hmm. uh, may I answer attempt to yes, answer please. the questions. Yes, thank you. Yes, so talking about those with underlying conditions. Yes, obviously we are planning to get as many as possible, but it is not likely we're going to cover 100%. Our aim would have been to cover 100%. What we are doing is that we, are, we have asked the districts to, sup, to supply us their dietary clinics across board, and especially for the major uh, hospitals, they have a good data on um, those with underlying conditions. So for example, we've already had the data for Confanoche. We are doing that for Kolebu. Greater Accra Metro has already submitted all, for all facilities within Greater Accra Metro, the number of people with underlying conditions, particularly diabetes, uh, hypertension, and cancers. When it comes to asthma, yes, for those that go to the asthma clinics, the data would already have been supplied. And once we give the vaccines out to the facilities, because their clients are already um, registered, they, they, they will do, will train them to do the vaccination. For those that are in the house, that is where the challenge will be. But so long as a, a doctor or a clinician certifies that you have the asthma, obviously uh, that person will be covered. But that is just for the very few vaccines that we are the first few vaccines. Uh, ultimately, every person will be covered. It's just the rapidity with which such people will be covered that may be an issue. But for, for now, I don't think that we need to worry too much because ultimately, everybody is going to be covered. Over. Thank, thank you so much. Um, hello, Dr. Apalu. Okay. Let me add something Doctor. to this. Okay. I want to add something to this. Thank you. What is, you see, the, 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 the aim is to make sure that we vaccinate all the at risk people. And since some, everybody is staying in a sub-district in a district, and they are districts, uh, the assemblymen and all sorts of people around there, we, should, we will make use of all of them to assist us to bring people that they know who are in the houses 
who maybe have not heard or have not gone to a clinic to go and register there so that in the long run, they all be registered, they all be vaccinated. And as we said, I said at the beginning, we are making use of every vaccine available everywhere. Once you have emergency use authorization, we will go ahead and go and make sure that through the African Medicine Supply Platform and bilateral uh, means we are going to make sure we get enough vaccines to vaccinate all Ghanaians who are supposed to be vaccinated. So nobody should rush. People should not be worried. We will try and get within the period. I'm sure by June, July, getting to the end of the year, we'll get enough people and enough vaccine to vaccinate all the people that you want to vaccinate. All what you want Thank to you. do is to make sure that the myth surrounding all these things is gone. And then people then get uh, very well accustomed that we are going to vaccinate everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Apalu? Yep. Dr. Apalu? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, issue of immunity has come up again. Someone wants to know when you take the vaccine, how long are you covered? Well, okay, so two things here. So in and then, terms of... Let me, yes. Doc, I won't cut you. Let me just add another question. Is there, is there any data to show the number of Black African... African I mean, Blacks or, or Blacks, yes, that's were included in the trial of the COVID vaccine. Is there right. any data? Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. So let me let so the let's start with the data. immunity, mm -hmm. and then we'll, mm -hmm. we'll work our way into the uh, demographic mm -hmm. breakdown. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so um, uh, immunity. So uh, f first things first. When we go back to that um, visual that we did when we did that short course in immunology earlier on, um, notice that uh, one of the things I said was, you know, shortly after. Your, your body then is, is, is built enough um, protection or cover so that when, when you get re-exposed, re you're, you're able to fight. We, without getting too technical, when you get the vaccine, it takes, it takes um, a, a while. Usually, typically, you, you, you're talking between about 14 days to about a month to, to, mm -hmm. to, form the, uh, to develop the immunity. And then there's a mm -hmm. component that is important. Yes, once you've developed the immunity, what is the durability of that immunity? Essentially, how long would it last before that protection wanes off? So at the moment, we know that the uh, uh, vaccines that are available, most of them, I mean, pretty much all of them are following that classical. Are those uh, mutations going to lead to the, the vaccine, uh, the virus, you, 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 you know, um, escaping the, the protection that you've developed. So these are slightly complex things that we're learning as we go along. Um, and, and, and therefore, I guess what we can say right now is yes, the protection is adequate for at least all of us to get vaccinated quickly to get this, uh, um, uh, the, the rates of infection down. That is the uh, important part. If we can get this, uh, the, the uh, uh, um, infection rates down to the point where uh, the, the virus doesn't have enough hosts to replicate and keep yes. developing, then we're okay. good. So let's not worry another... too much about that. And then the other okay, question about question. the demographics, um, it, the, the information is out there. I think I was reading one of the uh, uh, reports earlier on. It's, it's, it's all publicly uh, available. Where, and especially uh, with, with, with most of these pharma companies, there was a directive out by the US FDA towards the end of last year which, which, which goes into the whole need for uh, diversity in clinical research. And what that uh, guideline or directive actually does is this. For all, 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 all drugs or vaccines being developed, it's that there is a requirement that the developer, right, develops the, 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 the vaccine in a population that represents the target population of the product that's been developed. What that means is that during the developmental phase, it, the, the, there is that requirement that you ensure that the population that you end up, you know, using in your clinical trials represents the population that is going to end up using the medication. Okay. So, okay, meaning so, that all, so exactly, all so races in, have been handled. Exactly. All races have to be handled and tackled, to as okay. much as you can to the proportions that are globally represented. Okay. 
There's a, a question of yes. side effects. Yes. Side um, effects. Um, um, let me let me add on Mabel, and I probably take the side effect question because I'm okay. reading, I'm reading it. You see, what Derek has said is brilliant. The truth of the matter is, I live in the UK. He lives in the United States, and the Medicines and Health Product Regulatory Authority, which is the synergic institution for the FDA in the United States also published things like that. The sad truth is, even though the pharma industry and the universities want to have equity and diversity when it comes to ethnicity, we as blacks and ethnic minorities do not volunteer. They cannot coerce you or force you. I mean, sometimes I like to call a spade a spade, not an implement for digging. So people will forgive me if I'm a bit blunt with these things. We don't volunteer to actually get ourselves vaccinated. And there is step around the question because he doesn't want to say it because it's embarrassing. The truth of the matter is in the whole vaccine trials, black and ethnic minorities were 9.3%. 9.3%. It isn't that we were shut in a room. Look, I volunteered. I was a guinea pig. People wrote on Facebook that they, what if I die? What if my DNA changes? These are the sort of crap that we entertain. So we haven't moved from Walter Cocker saying no to Ebola um, vaccines to today. And that is why when I did my presentation earlier, I talked about a, um, what do you call it, head immunity threshold gap, which our population in Africa currently, 40% of the population is below 60 years. So technically, Africa cannot hit head immunity, and we shouldn't kid ourselves. The only way we're going to hit it is if we get involved in vaccine trials. Now, if globally, even those of us living in the UK and the United States of this world, because of the pressures that come from our families back in Africa, we don't volunteer. What makes anyone think that when they bring it to Putana International Airport and the likes of Dr. Nsia Sari and Achianu go and get into bilateral collaboration, Ghanaians would allow their children to go through a vaccine trial? No, let us kid ourselves. These are the things we need to confront. And then I would move to the side effects. Yes, there are side effects. I've had three jabs. And always I had a sore arm. Fortunately, I didn't get the headaches. Fortunately, I didn't get the bodily pains. But yes, there are bodily pains because you are hitting what is called the deltoid muscle. And that deltoid muscle is on your shoulder. And you get what we call rhabdomyolysis, which is just a breakdown of the muscle because you punctured it. And that would lead to pain. It happens in kids. The truth of the matter is, that's why when you are taking your child to get vaccinated, you are told to give them paracetamol before and after. If you are an adult and you don't take the same advice that your pharmacist will give to you for your kid, and you get pain and you get headache, it's got nothing to do with the vaccine. Let's try and demystify some of these things. And that is why I think today is great. We have well, NCC here. You can't tell doctor, me. sorry. Uh -huh. Doctor, doctor, before you yeah. go on, I have a question for you. So you put it together. Um, there's a question here. Someone wants to know, um, Yvonne, she says any, the side effects have been tackled. And he's, uh, she's asking if um, the side effects in the event that one has it, are there designated areas for people to report so that they will have data on all those who have been vaccinated and what they are going through? Is there anything like that? Yes, I will answer that question first. You see, when you send your child for immunization, you are told what can happen. You can have fever, the child will have pain, the child will be irritable, and then they will tell you if the child has fever, you can give the child paracetamol syrup or sponge the child down. If the fever continues, then uh, call to any health facility and you will see. We will send forms to every, from the um, chemical shop, pharmacy, to everywhere. The areas where people go to receive painkillers or buy things when they are sick, so that it, they will be reporting. Food and Drugs Authority and EPI will follow them up. If there's any severe issues, 
you call, there will be a number that Dr. Chiano and people will put out so that you call. You can go to any health facility and you'll be seen. I'll give you a very strange story, which somebody sent to me. And there's an elderly man in the US who went for vaccination. And when he was being vaccinated, he forgot his uh, reading grasps and left it at the place and went home. So when he was going home, he was feeling a bit, he couldn't see well. So he got a call back that he cannot, see, he cannot see well. Then they asked him to go to call the place that he went to for vaccination. They say, I'm Mr. So and so, I cannot see well. What should I do? He said, Mr. So and so, you forgot your pair of glasses here, so come for it. That's why we are not seeing you. So that's, <laughs> that's a joke about it. So people okay. take things out of this thing. The next thing I will say, um, Dr. Uh, Sapon, Kwame Sapon is talking about herd immunity, herd immunity, 70% will be not read it. I think uh, we are not too sure what percentage of the population should be vaccinated. I think there's still some discussion about it. So maybe Africa countries, the AU and African CDC, have chosen that we should try and immunize about at least 60% of the population. And that's what we are all heading towards. And I'm sure very soon, as other things about this uh, COVID-19, it will reach a stage where we all get to know what gives a herd immunity. But as he rightly okay. said, we'll continuously be trying to get people as many as possible to be vaccinated as quickly as possible so that we don't even introduce new uh, variants into the system and then we're going to look for vaccine. But I think what we have targeted ourselves, we will work towards that, that at least 60% of the population should be immunized. And as you move on, Ghana has a very young population. It's true. But when Dr. Chano was, was uh, talking, he said that we are also going to make sure that as we continuously be vaccinated, because children, uh, people under 18 were not used as part of the clinical trials, we will be doing our own surveillance research here. And who knows? We will then decide that from what we have seen so far, we can even go to children uh, under 10 and immunize them. Or maybe pregnant women, we can cohort them into first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester. If we are going to get a lot of benefit from it, why not? So we should not place too much premium. We are not going to get the herd immunity. I believe that it is not yet conclusive that herd immunity is between 75 and 80 percent. Thank you, Doctor. Please be on the line. Don't go. Um, you can make, I, you use can a I phrase add like something? Uh -huh. there's a question. I want to just if for any of you. So. There's a question hey, on what will be done I to people who refuse to take. you add a question? I understand you. Be based on the time. That's why I just want to add it. So you just take it. They're asking if what, what will be done to people who refuse to take the vaccine. Please, you can now answer. Yeah, people, people who refuse to take the vaccine will continuously be using advocacy. We'll be talking to them. We have not taken a firm decision that like other countries who say that if you refuse to take the vaccine, you either continuously be testing yourself at your own cost. That's what some countries are using. Some countries have also made uh, executive instruments that everyone should take the vaccine. But I know, so I, know our, I know our people in Ghana who will continue using, uh, we'll be communicating, we'll be talking to them. And when people see people who are taking the vaccines, that you see maybe when we start, the president himself is being vaccinated at the first a person to be vaccinated. Chiefs, imams, uh, uh, influencers, pastors, maybe somebody you trust so much is also been taking the distance. It will make people take the vaccine. And as I said, so far as some of us are concerned, you take the vaccine not only for yourself, but for your neighbor, for your relatives. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Chanu. Yes, so I wanted to add to the fact that the herd immunity threshold is actually not too clear. And so what probably my good friend and brother mentioned is the ones that have, have been modeled. Various countries have done their mo own modeling. I know South Africa is pegging herd immunity around 67% and so. But like um, my former DD, DG said, um, consensus is that at least if you're able to get six out of 10 people vaccinated, we are likely to break the transmission. And of course, that is tantamount to herd immunity. Um, now, coming back to uh, my friend, uh, Warwick. Kwame is my brother. Uh, if you, 
Yes, by the way. Um, Kwame talked about the fact look, that... Look, stop this, my brother, my brother. It's, we don't disclose family lines on this program. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> so um, Kwame was worried about um, the fact that the, because the Ghana's population is young, we are not likely to achieve the herd immunity. But one thing is that if you look critically at the data, about 3,000 children under 16 have been infected so far, compared to a total of 81,000 persons. If you do the math, you are looking at about 3.7, 3.8% of the entire um, infection or entire population of uh, I mean, infected. If you work, if you use the proportions of the populations to work out, the risks for an under 16 to that of an adult, or in this case, I'm defining it as somebody who is more than 16. It's 16 is to one. No. And so if you're, you have anything at all to target, it is those above 16. No. Therefore, I want to allay uh, Kwame's fears that if you look at the chances for somebody who is above 16, getting infected and probably getting a disease is 16 compared to one for that of and under 16, then you are likely better off targeting them, even though we know that eventually, once you have good data, the children will also be vaccinated. So th this is what I wanted to put as a submission. Thank you. Dr. Asante? Yeah. Dr. Asante, okay. Yeah, so I just some... wanted to, I mean, I know our time is up now, but I wanted to yeah. make my last point. And um, as we have Dr. Nsiasari and the, all the other GHS um, on the line. Um, as pharmacists, um, I am advocating that we use pharmacists because we are front lines. Um, we talked about side effects and how it's going to be reported. Most people will get to a pharmacist before they get to their hospital or they get to their doctor. And so let's use these avenues um, to help uh, facilitate all of this reporting and also um, just getting pharmacists involved in the rollout of um, the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So that's what I wanted to add on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but to, to, to Miss, can you, I make a submission on this? To answer, answer you quickly. Yes. The pharmacists will be also part of the people who will be vaccinated. Pharmacists yes. will also be used in pharmacy shops and chemical shops are places where people go first when they yes. haven't paid. So they will also be people who will be looking out for the adverse uh, reactions and the side effects. Okay. And the education. So, okay. Will, but I, I've seen somebody put something on it. Dr. That, Asante. Are we, are we going to allow private people to also import any vaccine to the country? The answer yes. is no. Thank you very the much. The answer is a big no. That's a question. Because we are in pandemic and we want to control and make sure that the right vaccines are brought into the country. The FDA gives emergency use authorizations for us to bring in the vaccine. So if any private person has money to finance any group of people, they should uh, add it to whatever government is doing and government will bring the vaccines in and make sure that they are vaccinated. But we are not going to do private for profit. We want everybody everywhere in Ghana to be able to afford this vaccination without any financial encumbrance. So we are practicing uh, the system where we want everybody everywhere. That is universal health coverage. So the vaccines are free. It's at no cost to anybody. It doesn't matter if the person is a millionaire or billionaire in Ghana. Oh. If you're a millionaire or billionaire in Ghana, you want to assist, get to a minister of health and then give your donation. It will be added to the cost and then pay for the vaccine that you want to bring. So no private person will be allowed or be given permission to bring any vaccine to the country for private purposes so that they can vaccinate for money. That is, will not be allowed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Chen, you wanted to add? Yes, 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 a couple of things. Hello, Doc. First, the community. Okay. Yes, um, can you hear me? 
Yes, just uh, a couple yes, of things. Can. On first, the community, the community pharmacists are considered as frontline health workers, but of course, our unit of operation is a district. So the district directors would have to identify all of them, and we know they are good at that. So they work in tandem to ensure that all community pharmacists, I mean, people who work within the community pharmacies are also vaccinated as part of the health workforce. Again, for the um, safety monitoring, apart from the PIPA work, actually we are going electronic. We work together with FDA. FDA has an app called the Med Safety app. This would be shared widely for the public as well as for those who would be reporting including the community pharmacies. So they are encouraged to use the app. It's a very simple app. So I'm sure they went once anybody who uses a WhatsApp can easily do that. So they will use that to report as well. The paper-based reporting is only a backup because some people are usually, I mean, are glued to the fact that they need to write something. That's a chance. For that, we, are also, we have we're also given the opportunity for that. Yes. The app, is it for the public or only for a selected group? Yeah, it's for, it's for the public. It's okay, so we can all download it. And it can be is used it on, by, yes, it can be used. It's on both, it's on the I, it can be I, iOS and then Android store. What I, which, what which I of the stores for now is mm. Android. I need to check with my colleague. Okay, all right, thank you. What I do know that is Android based and I need to check with my colleagues in FDA to see whether there's a version for <laughs> the iOS. But it's for the general public as well as reporting health workers or for health workers who do the reporting. Over. Dr. Santi. Yes. Dr. Santi. Doc, uh, Ms. Adi, are you on the line? Yeah, yes, I am. Okay, I have a question for you, so please be on standby. Dr. Santi. Yes, I'm here. Someone wants to know if the pharmaceutical society is, has a plan to roll out its own vaccine anytime soon. Are you developing any vaccines or any plans for vaccines in the near future? Um, actually, it's not up to Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana to do that. Um, that would be um, uh, up to FDA and uh, other research and development. But of course, we are always advocating for, um, you know, to get these things out, to get it rolled out and to get more um, research done but it's not up to Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana to be coming up with vaccines. Yeah, to come in quickly, like to, to come in quickly, mm -hmm. the government has, um, Question from, form a, mm -hmm. government has formed a committee to look at the development and manufacturing of vaccines in the country. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Adi. Ms. Adi. Yes. There's a question here for you. Um, someone wants to know if um, NCC has received enough funds to embark on this educational campaign. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, the funds um, have been allocated. We haven't received it yet, but that's, that's not going to be an issue. We are going to get the funding okay. very shortly. We already have a plan in place. And um, just in the next couple of days, weeks, days, we'll get the funding. Start. It's already been allocated. Okay. Um, Dr. Asari, yes, Dr. Asari, yes. this issue kept coming up on the issue of um, research institutions in Ghana not receiving enough or maybe uh, whether or not they are being told enough to be able to develop their own vaccines and for Ghana and all that with the Noguchi and Co. What's, what's, what are government plans to equip all these institutions to, to make them come up with their own vaccines in the near future? I think uh, is the Noguchis and the rest. Mm -hmm. I think I answered it very quickly. Um, there, there is a committee which the president has put together. And the committee is looking at all these things, including funding, including manufacturing. And we want to make sure there's no reason why we cannot, for example, make our own anti snake serum and anti rabies serum in Ghana. There's no reason why we cannot start also developing. We, we may start slowly and get to a point where we can also use the same technology they are using outside to also manufacture, develop and manufacture our own vaccines. There's, there's something that we, we have been put together and we are working very seriously and very fast 
to make sure that it happens in the shortest possible time. It is headed so, by a very active person, and we are going to make sure that it happens. And so, then to do this, the funding to all our research institutions will be part of it. I know that uh, the Minister of uh, Minister of uh, MISTI, Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation, have also come out with plans how to uh, fund the research institutions. And I know there's a percentage of the oil revenue which has been put so that it can be used by the research institutes to develop as quickly as possible. And this will all be part of it. We will consider all these things once the committee meets sometime this week and we start work. Okay, thank you. Um, our time is up. Um, I would like to thank the CDD for putting this program together. Dr. Esiasari, Dr. Asante, Dr. Palu, um, Ms. Adi, Dr. Kwame Saponsidu, Mr. Achianu, and all participants. We thank you so much for making it and then giving us insight into this whole vaccine issue. And to wrap up, it's very clear from the presentations that vaccines are very safe. We all had it when we were children. We, we investigated with the six childhood killer diseases and COVID is just be, COVID will be one of those many vaccines that we've had when we're growing up. So um, it's safe. Um, and then we, all, we it, it's also clear that we need more public education. And in here, we we'll call on the media. Today, I read an, I, a news item from ABC and there was a story on side effects for those who have had the vaccines. And some of, majority of them said they were having lymph nodes or something in their, in their bodies and they were worried. But in the story, it said it, it was a good sign that yes, it means the vaccines are working. But that wasn't what the media house did. They put it up, if, if, you, if you don't read the story and you see the headline, you panic. And you might think that, no, you won't go for the vaccine. So I would entreat the media, the media houses in Ghana, we really have a big role to play in educating the public to accept this. This, this COVID is, is, is a threat to the world economy, to businesses and all. And then the earlier we fight it, the better it will be for all of us. We thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Very Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Bye bye. For having us. Bye. 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 No, that's not to me. That's not to me.